evening, everyone. Uh, very nice to see you all. Um, was that me? Let's hope not. Um, I'm Andy Haldane. I'm chief executive here at the RSA. Fantastic to welcome you to the great room here at the RSA, those of you in the house, and to all of the, those of you um, online. I think it is me, isn't it? Let me try that. Uh, all of you online uh, being live streamed, uh, very welcome as well to our first main public event of the new school term. It's also, uh, as you'll all know, my first opportunity to express on behalf of all the staff and all the fellows uh, of the RSA our sadness at the loss of our patron, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. So the Queen's involvement with the RSA began way back when she became our president in 1947 and then subsequently uh, as our patron uh, following her coronation uh, in 1953. That means there's no one, no one uh, in the RSA's long and illustrious history who's had a longer association with the RSA uh, than her. And we'd like to extend uh, our thanks to her for her remarkable service, not just to this society, but of course to the whole country and indeed the Commonwealth and the world at large. And we'd also like to extend our deepest sympathies uh, to Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal, who is our current president, to His Majesty King Charles III, and indeed to the whole royal family during this period of national mourning. And at this time of national reflection, I think it's fitting that this evening's event addresses a subject of vital national importance, uh, namely uh, social justice and health uh, equality or inequality, more accurately. And our distinguished speaker this evening Sir Michael Marmot, has, has led the country on this crucial issue for many years, uh, initially as author of the hugely influential first Marmot Review back in 2010 and then its follow-up uh, in 2020. But it's not just uh, through his words, but also his deeds, that Michael has reshaped the debate and practices around health in the UK. That's led to the emergence of a growing number of marmot places across the UK, networks of towns and cities and regions working to develop a marmot approach to tackling those health inequalities. We'll hear much more about that approach during the course of this evening. Just last week, I think, Luton was named the first uh, marmot town. Uh, Michael was knighted, fittingly, by the Queen, uh, in the year 2000 for services to epidemiology and the understanding of health inequalities. He's Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health at UCL and Director of the Institute of Health Equity. Suffice to say, uh, these are issues crucial to the UK, to the world, and indeed more parochially are at the centre of the work of the RSA as well. For example, through our ongoing partnership with the Health Foundation, exploring young people's future health and economic security, the two things going together inextricably, as Michael, I'm sure, will set out in a second. So it's a great pleasure and a huge privilege to invite him to speak to us this evening. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Sir Michael Marmot. Thank you, and it is a pleasure to be here. Could we? Ah, there we go. Um, I called my second report in 2020, Build Back Fairer. As Andy's just described, uh, we published the Marmot Review in 2010. In 2020, we looked back at what had happened over the decade, and I'll talk about that. Then COVID struck. 
So we published Build Back Fairer, the COVID-19 Marmot Review. And at the time, particularly in the US, they were talking about Build Back Better, but I wanted us to Build Back Fairer. The opening line of my book, The Health Gap, my book, The Health Gap, <laughs> was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. Particularly at times like the present, we are very concerned with the future of our National Health Service, and rightly so. To have a national service free at the point of use is part of our core values as a society. But my concern is with the conditions that make people sick in the first place. It's not lack of health care that lead to health inequalities. It's inequalities in society. There have been three recent major challenges to health equity, greater health inequalities. A decade of austerity, the pandemic, and the cost of living crisis. And I will say something about each of these. The 2010 review, we had six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, you were talking about young people. The third was employment and working conditions. The fourth, really radical, I used to say we were the fifth richest country in the world. I think we've slipped to eight, perhaps, in terms of total GDP. But in a rich country, everyone should have at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. Number five, healthy and sustainable places in which to live and work. And number six, taking a social determinants approach to prevention. We had those six. In light of COVID, we added a seventh, tackle racism, discrimination, and their consequences. And the eighth should have been there from the beginning, which is pursue the action on net zero, the climate crisis, and health equity together. When we looked back in my 2020 report, the first thing to say is that life expectancy which had been increasing about one year every four years. In 2010, the rate of increase slowed dramatically and just about ground to a halt. Yeah. That's not right. That's not supposed to happen. Things are supposed to get better all the time. What happened in 2010? Any ideas? Well, we had a new government elected. They were a bit sensitive. You're not suggesting, surely, that anything we did some other time, I can tell you about an exchange with Jeremy Hunt, who was the health secretary. Um, you're not suggesting it was anything we did that led to this slowdown. Maybe we've just reached peak life expectancy. So we looked at other countries. We had the slowest improvement in life expectancy of any rich country except Iceland and the United States. We had not reached peak life expectancy. I was a bit cautious when we published our 2020 review. Typical academic could be, might be, possibly, on the other hand, you know, not a control expert. You know the garbage that we talk. Um, <laughs> well, the evidence since we published our 2020 report is even stronger that austerity was the culprit. And the problem was that health inequalities increased. These are regions, males and females, by level of deprivation. The top cluster are the least deprived 10%. And you can see that the regional differences are quite small. If you're rich, it doesn't much matter where in England you live. The life expectancy is quite good. And over the decade from 2010, life expectancy improved a bit. 
If you're poor, it matters much more where you live. The regional differences are much bigger. Life expectancy improved in London. And look at women, particularly. For every region outside London, life expectancy for the poorest 10% went down. I said rhetorically a moment ago, when life expectancy stopped improving, that runs counter to what we expect. How about health getting worse for the poorest people in society? That really is not supposed to happen. It's a reasonable expectation that health would keep improving all the time. And here we've got, for the most deprived 10% outside London, life expectancy is going down. Let me illustrate what I was talking about. I could point uselessly, but it wouldn't help you. Um, <laughs> the top is London, and the, the darker one is the northeast region. And what you can see by level of deprivation for the least deprived, there's almost no difference in life expectancy between London and the northeast. And then the greater the deprivation, the bigger the disadvantage of living in the north. Or to put it a different way, in the northeast, the gradient is steeper. And you notice it's not just the poor versus everybody else. It's a gradient. The greater the deprivation, the shorter the life expectancy. Now, if, you could, if I can do this without pointing, the dotted line is London 2010-12, the solid line 2016-18, and you can see that life expectancy improved in London at every level of deprivation. Now look at the northeast region. The solid line is the later period. Life expectancy went down for the bottom decile. It kind of went down for the second decile. It didn't improve for the third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth decile. You only start to get improvement for the top 40%. And it's a very important question. You can ask me the explanation, and in all honesty, I'll say I'm not sure why the consequences for health of being deprived should be bigger in the north than in London. It's a national index of multiple deprivation. Why are the consequences for ill health greater at a given level of deprivation in the northeast and the northwest than they are in London? I'm not sure of the answer, but I think it's a very important question. Given that we've been working with Greater Manchester, with Cheshire and Merseyside, with Lancashire and Cumbria, and now the North of Tyne Combined Authority is asking for our help. Very important question. We coined, in my 2010 review, the phrase proportionate universalism. It really slips off the tongue, doesn't it? That, that what I was trying to do, the classic Anglo-Saxon approach to social policy, is you target the worst off. A more Nordic approach is you have universalist policies. I was trying to forge a classic British compromise of putting them together. And so I said, let's have universalist policies, but with effort proportionate to need. Proportionate, you know, to, I could put it on a banner and go to the barricades. Uh, proportionate universalism. <laughs> when do we want it? In due course. <laughs> <laughs> and so to, oh, I could call it leveling up. There you are. Um, <laughs> So if this is the social distribution, less deprivation, higher life expectancy, and if you focus only on the bottom, you miss most of the gradient. So effort proportionate to need. What did we get post-2010? This is spending per person by local government in the decade after 2010. In the least deprived 20% of areas, look at the grey bars, which is total local authority spending per person. 
the spending went down by 16%. And then, the greater the deprivation, the bigger the reduction in spending. In the most deprived 20%, it went down by 32%. What we've got here is effort inversely proportionate to need. The greater the deprivation, the greater the need, the greater the need, the greater the reduction in spending. Could this have played a role in the slowdown, in improvement in life expectancy, the increase in inequalities, the reduction in life expectancy in the poorest people? Yeah, I think so. And when the two last candidates for leadership of the Conservative Party were saying, oh, I could cut taxes more than you. No, I will cut taxes even more than you. Uh, no, I'm the biggest tax cutter. And I thought, do you want to cut spending by local government even more? Or maybe what you want to do is increase child poverty. Child poverty is defined as less than 60% median income. Before housing costs in 2010-11, child poverty was 17%. Child poverty is defined as less than 60% median income. Before housing costs, it was 17%. After housing costs, 27%. And over the decade, that 27% rose to 30%. How was that achieved? Well, the, this represents the changes to household income as a result of the Chancellor's changes to tax and benefits post-2010. So look at the red, which is working age families with children. If you were in the poorest 10% of household income, your income would have gone down by 20% as a result of the Chancellor's changes to taxes and benefits. If you were in the next decile, it would have gone down by 12%, and then the richer you were, the less the reduction. A clear policy to make poor people poorer and to increase inequalities. And from all the evidence that we have, other things equal that will damage health and make health inequalities worse. We went through education, we went through each of my six domains, and it looks pretty bad for all of them in the decade from 2010 on. And then, as I said, came COVID. And you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, people said it's the great leveller. Garbage! <laughs> you never get big external shocks like that that affect people equally. It was utterly predictable that COVID would expose the underlying inequalities in society and amplify them. And so it did. There's the social gradient in all-cause mortality, the dark green, and the paler green, the social gradient in COVID-19. And that's important because a lot of the political discussion was, well, now we've got the vaccine, it's all over, we've solved COVID we've still got the inequalities. Remember that? That didn't change. Um, in fact, they were slightly steeper with COVID. And I'd shown in the decade up to 2020 that life expectancy for the poorest 10% went down. These are ONS figures for the triennium 2018 to 20 compared with the previous three years. And life expectancy went down in the bottom four deciles of deprivation. In fact, for men, it didn't improve at all. It fell for those three years. And that's largely a pandemic effect. That's largely a 2020 effect. For women, it did improve in the top six deciles. But now we're talking about a decline in the bottom four deciles. That's what I mean by exposing and amplifying the inequalities. And if we look at healthy life expectancy for the most deprived, 
Women living in the most deprived areas are expected to live a third of their lives in poor general health. And you can see healthy life expectancy shows a steeper gradient than life expectancy. Some US colleagues looked at this. They said that they talk about comparison with 19 peer countries. The life expectancy in the US, which is the red, went down 2020 compared with 2019 and went down again in 2021. And the comparison countries, the worst, are Scotland, Northern Ireland, Germany, and England and Wales of these 20 rich countries. We got the big decisions right, didn't we? We just managed the pandemic really badly. And I ask myself, what's the link between the fact that we had the worst improvement in health pre-pandemic in that decade, bar the United States, and an increase in inequalities, and we managed the pandemic nearly worse than any other country except the United States. And my suggestion is the link is poor, poor governance and political culture, increase in social and economic inequalities, the lack of investment or the decline of investment in public services. We were ill prepared for the pandemic and we weren't very healthy. And then, so that was the second of my three challenges, the austerity, the pandemic, and then the cost of living crisis, which I have described and I don't think it's over the top to describe it as a potential humanitarian calamity. The Resolution, for, it's hard to keep up, the Resolution Foundation has done a fantastic job in analysing what's happening. This is already out of date. This was at the time of the Chancellor's spring statement. That was two chancellors ago, I think. <laughs> um, I'm trying to, um, we're on our fourth health secretary in 18 months. Um, I was to, met some Italian colleagues at a meeting last week and I said, you know, we used to look at Italy as joke politics. And he said, look at you now. <laughs> yeah. God. So take a single person with one child working 20, oh God, that's Victorian time. It's not the child working 20 hours a week. <laughs> it's, the, it's the single person. Let's for argument's sake, say it's a woman, a single mother. And in September 2021, her annual income would have been 18,265, which is probably 60% median income at the time, maybe a bit less. She would lose 1,040 pounds a year because of removal of the boost to universal credit. Inflation, and say this is Going back to May, uh, inflation's more now, she'd lose another 1,200 pounds, but there'd be some salary increase, tax fiddling and so on. So the net is 584 pounds a year, worse off, 3%. 3% doesn't sound like much. If you're at or below the poverty line and you lose 11 pounds a week and you're as everybody's been saying, trying to choose between heating and eating, it would be an absolute calamity if your child needed a new pair of trainers. What are you going to do? And that's intolerable stress on trying to make ends meet. I was doing an interview with LBC and he said, you're not saying that that would lead to mental illness, are you? I mean, that's just unhappiness. Oh, God. No, no, mental illness, that's a consequence of failure to make ends meet. Food insecurity. Smaller meals or skip meals, being hungry but not eaten, or not eaten for a whole day. Dramatic rise between Japan, January and April from the Food Foundation. One in seven households in April had food insecurity. Can you imagine what it's going to be like this winter? Working age adults in working families in poverty. So in 2005-06, about 60% of people who were in poverty 
had at least one adult in the family who was in work. 2019-20, that had gone up to nearly 70%. So the majority of people in poverty, below the poverty line, are in households where at least one adult is working. That's a bit important, isn't it? These are not people who are work shy or feckless or lazy. They're poorly paid. That's why they're in poverty. I'm a bit nervous here. Um, <laughs> as Andy knows, because I wrote an editorial in the BMJ, I praised the four missions, the 12 objectives of the Leveling Up White Paper. I said it was terrific. Um, when I first read 330 pages, I said, this is terrific. I could have written this, and then I read it some more and said, no, this is much better than I could have done. This is great. Till I got to the money part. This is from IPPR North. The 2021 levelling up allocation is £32 per person in the North. And over the previous decade, each year, they took £413 per person away. So the analysis may be brilliant, but if you're not going to put any money into it, you won't get very far. That's the bad news. The good news is we've been working all around the country at their request. I don't go around trying to sell our services. Um, Coventry was the first Marmot City after my 2010 report. Then Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham invited me. And um, Luton, the first Marmot town that was last week. Uh, Waltham Forest, Cheshire and Merseyside. It's terrific. I'm really excited. People say to me, you must be really miserable. You've been talking about this topic all your life and things seem to be getting worse. Don't you feel like you're banging your head against a wall? And my response is, I don't bang my head against a door if the door refuses to open. I push on doors that open. And we've been invited in by all of these local areas. Build back Farrer in Greater Manchester. And they're working on it. It's still part of the active program of work in GM. Uh, that was our framework. Altogether Farrer in Cheshire and Merseyside. And uh, we're starting to work with business. One has to be nervous. In public health, we've been suspicious of business for good reasons. Alcohol, tobacco, junk food, dreadful working conditions. Um, P&O, there's a great public health organization um, to working conditions. Uh, so we've been suspicious of business. So when legal and general, I think they have two trillion pounds under investment. And they asked, what could we do that would improve health and reduce health inequalities? So we produced a report, the Business of Health Equity, the Marmot Review for Industry, and we said three domains of recommendations. You employ people. Good, good, and this is not just for LNG, this is for all businesses. You employ people, you can do a P&O and sort of sack everybody and bring you know, unskilled people back, or you can treat people well. It'll be improved their health and potentially good for the business. The second is you produce goods and services. Um, they can be good for health or bad for health. And the third is a bit like we talk about anchor institutions in the NHS. You have a broader impact on the community, the environment, your commissioning, purchasing, and the like. So we're trying to include business in our local networks. So to come back, my eight recommendations, give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, employment and working conditions, having enough money to live on, cost of living crisis is relevant, healthy and sustainable places to live and work, 
and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. And then the two more, tackling racism, discrimination and their consequences, and pursuing health equity and the environment agenda together. But I would say, I was asked by a journalist last Thursday, Thursday morning before Her Majesty died and the cataclysmic changes, he said, if you were invited into Downing Street on day three of the new Prime Minister, what would you say? And I said, I'd address, she ought to address these, but put a fair distribution of health and well-being at the heart of all government policy. Well, thank you, Michael, for that wonderful, wonderful exposition of where we are and why we ended up there. Uh, we'll have a quick chat. I'll pop a few questions Michael's way, really easy ones. Then we get the audience, Michael. Things get trickier then. Uh, so do prepare your questions, uh, both in the room and online. I'll try and pick up the online ones uh, on this iPad, if I can work it. <laughs> Can I ask about, start off, Michael, just on, um, you covered the, the regional, the spatial dimensions to some of these health inequality problems. You covered some of the um, deprivation dimensions of those inequalities. You covered some of the gender dimensions of it. Can you say something about the, the sort of, um, the, the generational dimensions of them? How the burden has been felt by young people versus older people, whether we've seen any patterns there as to whether the burden is being disproportionately borne by younger people versus elder ones? Yeah, it, it's harder to say if the burden is disproportionately um, in health terms because the health patterns are so different by age. What we can say, uh, as you know well, is that in income, with respect to income, uh, income of pensioners was protected of older yep. people. Um, the triple lock, so-called, whereas child poverty went up. So at the time when older people were more or less protected, um, child poverty was going up. And there is a relation between income inequality and social mobility. The greater the income inequality, the less the social mobility. The more young people have, get stuck at the level that their parents were. If, and given that we've had this rise in inequality, that's likely to go along with less social mobility. And the other part, when I talked about financial difficulties causing mental illness in the parents, mental illness in the parents is an adverse childhood experience. And that actually has a negative impact on the developing brain. Children whose parents are exposed to intolerable financial stress and deprivation, their brain, the children's brains develop less well. Um, so it has an impact on their life chances. Yeah, yeah. very interesting. And when we come to um, what you've been doing in the various Marmot places and the recipe book you've applied to address some of the issues there, could you say a bit more about you know, what the key ingredients, the key levers of policy that you've spoken about to, to break into what is a very knotty problem, interconnected mm -hmm. problem, that combines the economic and the social and the educational and the environmental. It's a complex mix of ingredients. How do we think about those in a way that... Well, the six, the original six, is a starting point. And we don't go in with um, what the Americans call a sort of cookie cutter, uh, boilerplate or whatever you call it, with a standard set, this is what you've got to do. Yeah. Well, this is our starting point. This is what the evidence says is important. Now, how are you going to do that in Cheshire and Merseyside? What are your priorities? First, 
Second, it's very important to recognise this is not just the healthcare system, but integrated care systems are important. And in Cheshire and Merseyside, it was the ICS that was our commissioner, whereas in Greater Manchester, it was the mayor, Andy Burnham, and the chief executive of Manchester City Council. But so the second point is getting all the key players, local government, the voluntary community sector, faith sector, yep. um, the health and care system, the integrated care system, uh, and community, because the ones that I've mentioned don't necessarily represent community, getting community, hearing the community voice, and that's important too. And uh, it's, it's not a neat process, because when you've got all these players. Um, but that's good, that's, that's part of it. I mean, I've had people say to me, God, this is a mess, how are you ever gonna get there? And I'm grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> this is a glorious mess. This is exactly what we want, people getting engaged. We know what the evidence shows, and we've summarized it in my six domains, now eight. But what you do with that at local level, and for example, with Coventry, which was the first one, they approached me, they said, we've been a Marmot City for five years, we want to renew it, is that okay with you? Well, it's not up to me, if you want to do it, great. And I've been to meetings there, they've got the police, and the fire and rescue mm -hmm. service, and education, and public health, and health and social care, and local government. The chief executive of Coventry City Council is terrific. He's, uh, he's inspirational and he's an important player in it. But he works closely with public health and with us. So we get all the players, which I say can be messy, but um, it seems to have gone really well in those two I mentioned, GM and Cheshire and Merseyside. And Luton seems possibly excited as my colleague said most people in Luton will be saying Marmot Town what the hell does that mean she said the poor people of Luton firstly looking for marmots and then the Queen died <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible day they had on Thursday um, and on that, on that point it's interesting um, what you say about uh, joined up policy making because my observation from a somewhat different vantage point, they're not too dissimilar actually, is that you know, the capacity for joined up decision making is that much greater yeah. at the local level yeah. than at the national level. You go to GM, you know well, and I know pretty well too, one of the secret sources of their success is the capacity for a joined up conversation among the different arms of policy between the transport and the business and the education and the local government and the health service. Has that been your experience too, that actually go local is the key here to tackling these things? Yes, and uh, um, Wales is about the population of GM. It's about yep. 2.8 or 3 million people. The first time I met Mark Drakeford, he was Minister of Health in Wales and the CMO the chief medical officer took me in to meet the Minister of Health and I'm talking to him and he said the Minister of Finance needs to hear this conversation and he picked up the telephone <laughs> and five minutes later the Minister of Finance was there. Now could you imagine a Secretary of State for Health saying the Chancellor needs to hear this conversation and calling the Chancellor and he'd say, well, in three weeks' time, you know, maybe we could get together or something. Not fine. And then he said, Mark Drakeford said, we've got a Minister of Social Justice. I think he needs to be in on this conversation. So five minutes later, I'm sitting with three ministers. <laughs> and that is a scale thing. Now, Mark is now the first minister. Um, and I went to, the first in-person meeting I went to was the St. David's Festival of ideas in um, Pembrokeshire and I, at the dinner I found myself sitting next to the Minister of Health, the Welsh. She said it's not an accident that we're sitting next to <laughs> I engineered it because Mark Drakeford said I should meet you and the next thing I know I'm having a conversation with the Minister 
of, I think it's social justice, a different minister. So, you know, Wales is of a scale where they all talk to each other all the time. It's not ideal, you know, nothing's ideal. Uh, but th at that scale, that conversation is terribly important. Let's go to the audience uh, and take a couple of questions and then we'll go uh, online and we'll start. I'll take a couple of questions if that's okay, Michael. Sure. Uh, one here, should wait for the Keely in the microphone, and maybe one here as well, Keely, if that's okay. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Thank you for that talk. I'm Sancia Alassia, the Acting Director of Diversity at London South Bank University. And um, it's really interesting to hear what you've got to say. And I was wondering, from your experience, are there certain groups, and I'm thinking groups that are covered by the Equality Act, that tend to fall into the lower socioeconomic um, um, deprivation? And if so, why is that? And what can we all do as a society in our various roles to start to change that pattern? Thanks. Great. Do you want to take one more, Michael, and then we'll just here. I was going to be greedy and ask for two, but anyway, I'll, I'll make them very quick. Um, the first question was, of the six principles that you mentioned, is there one, or perhaps two, which carry disproportionate weight in terms of driving outcomes? Um, and the second question was just to ask you if you could talk a little bit more about Wales and their Future Generations Act and the kind of legislation that they're putting in place to address some of these issues. Thank you. Terrific questions. Um, in my 2020 report, um, the, the 10 years on, we said that it was very difficult to get a handle on ethnic differences because uh, they're just not the same systematic data collection. ONS, which I think has been brilliant, the Office for National Statistics, has been brilliant through the pandemic, and is first rate anyway, but particularly brilliant through the pandemic. When they published their COVID figures, <sighs> three times, four times higher COVID mortality in black Caribbean, black African, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, and to a lesser extent, Indian. And they attempted to adjust for geography, where people live, and other socioeconomic characteristics. And it varied a bit by ethnic group. Um, it was probably a bit more than half, on average, uh, could be accounted for by geography where people lived and other socioeconomic characteristics. And my response to that, I, I mean, I remember when it w the data were published and the Secretary of State uh, was on the BBC and he said, oh, this is terrible, people should wash their hands. And I was asked, what did I think? I said, good advice from the Secretary of State and I think we should deal with structural racism. <laughs> And what should we, but what should we do tomorrow? Tomorrow we should start dealing with structural racism. In fact, I think this afternoon we should start doing that. And my response to those data was, which is the thrust of your question, that very crudely, two approaches. One is, why are certain ethnic groups more likely to be in states of deprivation? socioeconomically deprived. Now, it's, it varies. You know, Gujarati um, Asians from East Africa tend to be less deprived than the average and not more deprived. It, you know, it varies by different group. But still, that's an important question. And then the second question is, what else is going on? And there's good evidence. Um, the, we were very fortunate that the Commission on Racial Ethnic disparities, the CRED report, actually produced a lot of the evidence for structural racism in education, in the police and criminal justice. Having helpfully gathered the evidence, they said, no, there's nothing to see here. We can, <laughs> there's, you know, there's nothing here at all. Um, but anyway, they compiled the evidence. So I think we need to deal with both of those. They're very important. Um, since I started doing this, forgive me, I've been asked your question, is there one thing you would recommend? And I say, yeah, there is one thing I would recommend. Read my report. <laughs> <laughs> if there were only one, I would have only made one recommendation. And they're interrelated. Child poverty, cost of living, 
social determinants approach to prevention, diet, housing, which is part of my number five, they're all tied in together. Think about fuel poverty. That's poverty, that's poor quality housing, and it's the cost of fuel. That's, that's not in my six. But housing and poverty are, so they're interrelated. So no, there's not one that I would recommend. Wales, um, I'm on a, I have quite a lot to do with the government in Wales one way or another. I'm on an independent commission that the First Minister set up on the constitutional future of Wales. What do I know about constitutions? I mean, most of it is just over my head. Uh, but apparently, the First Minister had recommended that I be on it because of my concern with health and well-being. And I showed my colleagues on the commission the data that Wales looks less healthy than England. And in the decade from 2010, I didn't show you the data, but I talked about it, when England was not doing well, Wales did worse. And I said, you've got the Future Generations Act. Arguably, I've seen comments saying that Wales is the most progressive government in Europe. Why is Wales doing worse than England in health terms? And I don't know the answer, but it seems to me a very important question. Is it just the funding settlement from Westminster? Is it deep-seated poverty and that there's not enough that government can do? I mean, the Future Generations Act in Wales is inspirational. It's fantastic. So then the question is, why is Wales doing worse than England in health terms? And, and for me, it's an important question, not just because I'm a public health person concerned about health, but because I think of health as a marker of how well the society is doing. And inequalities in health are an indicator of inequalities in society. So if you looked at country A, country B, you say country A is worse than country B. Well, country A is Wales and country B is England. You know, these are challenge, you know, this is the researcher in me coming out. I haven't given up my thirst for understanding. I'm not just a policy wonk. Um, I really want to know what's going on and why. I'm going to go online for a, a question or two, Michael, if that's okay. And let me start with this one from Taz Razul, which is, how might a politician in a non-health government department find a way of putting health at the centre of their own policies? Yeah, I've had more sleepless nights over that question. <laughs> um, since I chaired the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, I've been asking myself, why should a Minister of Education care? Yeah. And if you talk to Ministers of Education about health, oh, they say you're talking about giving kids T-shirts to run around the park once a week. <laughs> no. What, and I think the way a minister in another department should think about it is think about equity. What we know classify kids by level of deprivation. The, back in my 2010 review, it was something like only a third of children in the most deprived area got five Cs or above a GCSE. Only a third. I talked to various educational experts. Because I'm a novice at all of this stuff, I have to talk to people who know things. And so I talked to various educational experts and said, come on, give me your best guess. If those kids in the most deprived decile were scoring up to their potential, how, what proportion would get five C's or above? Well, nobody can answer my question, but it, you know, 50%, 70%, I got different answers. But it's not a third. Yeah. Um, so it's not, you know, we know enough about the evidence that we wouldn't expect kids from the poorest decile to score as well as kids from the best off decile, whether it's genes or environment or what it is, but we wouldn't expect it. But we'd expect them to do better than they do. Then comes the pandemic and it increases the educational divide. And if we look at, I 
I didn't mention this, but if we education spending went down by 8% per child in the decade from 10, 2010 on, but the reduction in spending was greater in more deprived areas. So we were saying, we're not going to put the money into it. I mean, how can you justify reducing education spending by 8% over a decade? Um, and how can you then justify doing it in a regressive fashion? So what I would say to the Minister of Education, put equity at the heart of what you're doing, and then you're, you're working on my agenda, and he's working on your agenda, the levelling up agenda too. And I'd say that to, for local government funding, and I'd say that to whoever's responsible for housing. I mean, with housing, there's a direct health connection. I mean, if the houses are cold and there's mold and damp, there's a direct health consequence of growing up in a cold, moldy, damp house. So there's a very con um, direct connection. But in general, solve the housing problem and you will be making a contribution to health equity. Very good. Go back in the room and pick up a couple more questions. I got the back there, gentleman at the back, and then uh, where's your other microphone, Keely? Two microphones, got it. And maybe on, on this side of the room, the gentleman in the, uh, in the cap. Thank you, Sir Michael, that was really where outstanding. Where are you? Can you um, wave at me? Thank you. <laughs> I just wonder, um, arising from m my own work, which has engaged with the reports that you've done um, a great deal, but whether we still need a good psychological theory to explain why health inequity affects people. What exactly is the mechanism by which falls in, in living standards, whatever it is, um, in poverty, but actually transmits into dents in well-being. I think myself it's around the sense of self and the ingredients for that relative to relative poverty and, 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 and all that in, in a society like ours. It's our type of society which is accentuating that. Um, but I wonder what your, your, your take on is. Whether we still need a good explanation of the mechanism. Thank you. Um, Hello. Uh, thank you, Andy, for those beautiful words at the beginning, by the way. And I think nothing, more, I think everyone here will agree that nothing underlines more your institution's commitment to solving poverty and uh, other horrors related to that area than your institution's close relationship with multi-billionaires. My question is, um, should we now do something very similar to what France is doing, which is now take an adult approach to nationalizing these energy companies and other factors, other companies which our lives depend on to live through a winter or for food. So the question is, should we now start looking at nationalization? Thank you. Michael. Well, um, both great questions. Uh, I do have a psychological theory, um, but it may be wrong. Um, in my own research, um, looking at the work environment, we have good evidence that low control in the workplace, in fact a combination of high demand, low control, and lack of support, um, is stressful and increases risk of mental illness and cardiovascular disease. So I, that control dimension is very important. Secondly, again from my own research, we looked at effort reward imbalance. People who put in high effort but get low reward. And that reward could be financial, it could be self-esteem, um, personal development, status and recognition. It's not just money, money's important, but it can be these other things which I think start to touch on the things that you're talking about. In the Global Commission, the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, 
which I chaired, and I said, we put empowerment at the heart of what we're trying to achieve. And I thought of empowerment in three ways. The first was material. If you don't have the money to feed your children, you can't be empowered. The second was psychosocial, having control over your life. And the third was political, having voice. And the time I was doing this, Nick Stern had written um, with one of his previous distinguished hats on. He'd written, uh, I guess it was with his World Bank hat on. And he talked about empowerment and economic development going hand in hand. And I was very much, I was delighted when I read that from a distinguished economist, that because I'd been talking about control. And then this Nick Stern, the chief economist at the World Bank at the time, talking about empowerment. I've used the word dignity. Don't ask me to define it, because I, I think of it more as an organizing principle that relates to these two other concepts that I've talked about, um, having little control and not getting appropriate reward for all the effort. I mean, it, it, trying to make ends meet is, requires a great deal of effort. And what reward do you get? Lack of success. You still can't get through the week. And that uh, very undignified life, it's a threat to dignity. So I don't think we're a world away from having meaningful theories. And in fact, I've said, and I've written this all over the place, that I think an important gateway by which social determinants impact on health is through the mind. Um, yeah, it's not the only gateway, but it's through the mind. Um, and that's stress pathways, it's behaviours, smoking, drinking, eating, and so on. Uh, social relationships, very important. Your question about nationalisation, um, I'm not the expert on you know, how we, we should organise our energy market. I'm pretty convinced that it's dysfunctional. Um, and, the, you know, the idea, uh, um, Andy will explain to me afterwards, why when the price of gas goes up, we pay more for wind power, and that's the way our market works. Um, to a doctor like me, that doesn't sound terrific, actually. The people are going to f freeze and go without food this winter because the price of wind power is affected by the price of gas. Now, say, an economist explained to me why that makes sense. But what I would say, I'd answer a slightly different question. So having ducked your question about nationalization, I'd, I'd make it part of a more general discussion. A bit like I said about low taxes. I think the question should not be low tax, you know, what the right level of taxation is. I don't think the question is what level of privatization or uh, public ownership should there be. For me, the question is what gets the best well-being and health of the population? What's the best way to do it? Now, current model ain't doing very well. That's what the evidence shows. Health inequalities are increasing. Whatever we're doing isn't working right. And there's a cost of living crisis. So we need to deal with that. But I wouldn't go into it with an ideological position of what the right level of taxation is or the right level of public ownership. Let's have a proper discussion about what we need to do to achieve the best achievable levels of equity of health and well-being. I want to draw things to a close um, in just a second, but I, I, I can't but help um, ask a final question of you, you, you Michael, on, on this front. I know there are lots more questions in the room. Um, and that's to give us some grounds for optimism. Two. Grounds for optimism. So I was, my hope, I suspect, is that you know, if some good could have come from the COVID crisis, it was that it put health issues right at the front and centre yep. of the policy debate and right in front of centre of people's mind's eye. And that we would not forget 
off the back of that, the importance of doing something to address the issues that you set out today. Would you share that optimism now, a little while on, that this has now captured the policy and public imagination in a way that would at least tackle the inequalities you've set out so brilliantly this evening? Well, I, I've got mixed feelings. Like, I have the same reaction you. Firstly, I have to say that one of the benefits of the pandemic is that I didn't have to explain to people what an epidemiologist was. <laughs> <laughs> you no know, idea, I've spent my whole life. You know. <laughs> do you know what it's like for my children in school? What does your dad do? <laughs> oh, forget it. You know. <laughs> it's too complicated. Um, but absolutely right. Uh, uh, firstly, health, and secondly, government intervention. I wrote a review of Adam Tooze's book, which you must have read, um, Shutdown. And Adam Tooze, I mean, I misquoting him slightly, but um, neoliberalism ran into the buffers on the 9th of March, 2020. Um, I'm misquoting Adam Tooze only slightly. I mean, brilliant book, I must say, because Normally, and now I'm really out of my depth, um, normally when the share price goes down, the bond market goes up. I don't understand. You can see I'm out of my depth. But normally, you know, shares, equities go down, bonds go up. And they both went down. And there was panic in the system. And, uh, you know, I'm feeling very nervous sitting next to Andy Holden, <laughs> but I'm quoting Adam Tooze. There was panic in the system. By the end of 2020, I think I've got this figure right, the rich countries had issued $18 trillion of new debt. And half of that debt, so it was issued by the Treasury, and half of it was bought up by the central bank. I thought, hey, this is really clever. There must be a technical term for this. It's called a conjuring trick. The one branch of government issues debt and the other branch of government buys the debt. So this is government intervention on incredible scale. The idea that it could all be left to the market, um, it's just not right. And in this country, if you didn't notice these machinations, if like me, you didn't, review Adam's book for The Lancet, so I had to read it, but it was a brilliant read. Um, the bailout scheme. Wow, this is the government, essentially, universal basic income, UBI, um, in, in March 2020 or whenever it was. So the idea that government should stand back and not get involved, and A, health was important, and B, government intervention was important. That was a major change. And the reason I called my report my, in December 2020, Build Back Fairer, because I thought, everything's changed. Um, the whole, you know, we're no longer in this neoliberal universe. I even said things like, you know, completely over the top, that Franklin Delano Roosevelt launched the New Deal in 1932, and that lasted. That was the orthodoxy till Reagan in 1980, so just under 50 years. And then what Reagan and Thatcher launched in 79, 80, that's lasted about 40 years, time for a new model, and that's what we're going to get, and that's what the pandemic showed us. Signs aren't terribly promising just at the moment. <laughs> They're not terribly promising. And let me finish by saying, because you asked, am I optimistic? And I used to go around the world saying I was an evidence-based optimist. And a Brazilian colleague said in his Brazilian accented Portuguese, Michael, you're using the English language incorrectly. You're not an optimist, you're hopeful. Right, go on. He said, an optimist believes things will get better. You don't believe things will get better. You're hopeful that they will. And that's a very important distinction. I'm grateful to my Brazilian colleague because 
if we all work on it, if an optimist might say, well, I'll just sit back and watch it because it's all going to get better. But those of us who are hopeful can work together with Coventry, with Greater Manchester, with Cheshire, with Luton, with Gwent, Gwent in Wales. So we can work together to make it better. So we are in a very dark time. Um, if you think we're in a dark time, look across the Atlantic at the United States. Um, but we're in a very dark time. But if we all are hopeful, and I would say act on the evidence, we can make things better. And what a fantastic way to wrap things up. We're into overtime. I have to draw things to a close, I'm afraid. Thank you, everyone uh, online and everyone in the room uh, for joining us and for your terrific questions. Sorry we couldn't get to more of them in the time. Uh, if those in the chat, there are links in there to all manner of RSA things, events, strategies, and the like. That's full of hopefulness, all of those links. Uh, because the essence of what the RSA does is social impact through having that sense of hopefulness and collective action, the like of which you've demonstrated right across the country, Michael. And to Michael, a huge thank you to him for what's been a typically brilliant and brilliantly relevant and timely and important conversation. So please join me in thanking Michael, Marla and the <laughs>